Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and I'm Dr. Cindy Wong and today I would like to continue on where I left off last time and talk more about my experiences as a resident. So the next thing I want to talk about is hematopathology. For us, we have to do three to four months of hematopathology and there is a lot of hematopathology. Even though it's technically considered CP, there is actually a lot of uh, hemopath on the AP boards. So even if you're an AP only person, this is technically hemopath is like an AP CP like middle ground where even if you're AP only, you still have to take uh, hematopathology, like I said, because it's on the boards. But that said, you can be CP only and do a hematopathology fellowship and practice hematopathology. So that's why I kind of just lumped it in CP because, uh, well, actually all of our attendings in our hemopath department are CP only trained. And so that's why it's kind of more CP than, than AP. And in hemopath, we look at bone marrows, we look at lymph nodes, and we look at body fluids. Uh, it really kind of depends on your program, which they're more heavy on. So my program is more heavy on bone marrows than say the lymphoma uh, lymph node portion of it. We get uh, at least eight or to like 16 bone marrow biopsies a day. Bone marrow biopsy workups are very extensive. Not only do we have to look at them on the slide and look at the blood smears, we also have to look at the uh, flow cytometry portion of it. And most of our bone marrows, I would have to say a good chunk of it is multiple myeloma and others are like MDS or leukemia and stuff like that. There are programs that are more heavy with lymph nodes and uh, uh, lymph nodes will be for lymphoma workup or for some benign uh, lymph node pathology. Most of the time when we get lymph nodes, it's kind of like a frozen for uh, anatomic pathology where it will be coming from the OR and we'll go to the gross room, we'll take it, we'll do a quick touch prep or a smear of the lymph node and you know look at it to see if we see some sort of um, lymphoma. If not, we'll, it will always send it for full cytometry and then we'll always of course process on as an H and E slide to look at. Uh, like I said, it's kind of like a frozen diagnosis because if we are able to do a touch prep on it, we'll let the clinician know right away if we see some like atypical lymphoma cells or it's a reactive thing or something like that. And then um, the fluids, we in I don't know if this is true for all heme path departments, but uh, for us, when a person gets fluid drawn, a portion of it gets sent to heme path and another portion goes to cy um, cytology. So for heme path, it's a faster turnaround and it's like malignant or non-malignant diagnosis. Whereas in cytology, we it's uh, malignant or non-malignant, but we also would have to do stains to further sub classify what kind of malignancy it is. So yeah, that is basically what happens in a heme path. It's very different from a search, search path because it's kind of like cytology in which the smears and the things we look at, there's a lot of like 3D component and looking at blood cells and looking at bone marrow hematopoiesis and looking at the different stages of blood cell growth. And I, I don't know. I just don't have an eye for it. Like I could, I could tell what's a lymphocyte or what's a neutrophil or what's an eosinophil. But then you're asking me like, oh, what stage of granulocytic differentiation is this cell? I'm just like, oh, oh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. A heme path is definitely not for me. A heme path is something that you can't just look at it and be like, yep, that's what it is. That's why I like GI, because a lot of times in GI, you could look at the HNE and you'd be like, yep, that's the diagnosis, next case. But in heat path, it's, there's a lot of work up to it and it's a bunch of stains <laughs> and you have to take all of the different components, the stains, the H&E, &E, the flow cytometry, and put that all together as to your final diagnosis. I think the last thing I can mention is we don't actually do the bone marrow biopsies ourselves. The clinical team does it, we just get it. But if you want to see what a bone marrow looks like, you're always welcome to contact the clinical team and be like, hey, I want to look. But yeah, that's hematopathology for us. Like I said, for us, it's a three or four month. It's uh, pretty chill in the sense that usually we start at eight and we're done by five. 
not bad, right? Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is molecular. Uh, molecular pathology is like the new hot thing in pathology. It's also one of those like APCP cross betweens, but most people who practice it is CP trained. Molecular pathology is basically analyzing next gen sequencing data for um, tumor. So uh, in surgical pathology, you'll have a tumor resection and then they want to know the molecular for it so they can do personalized treatment for the patient. So next gen sequencing, you're able to uh, detect mutations, to detect copy number variations, and you're uh, able to detect translocations and all of that it comes out as a raw data done by the tech and then so as the pathology and the residents we are looking at the raw data and determining which mutations are significant which amplification or loss is significant which you know like and almost all translocations are important right so we write a report uh naming all of the important stuff and giving a correlation to like, for example, if this was done for lung cancer, we'll say this mutation is commonly seen in lung cancer or this mutation uh, is not, and but it's commonly seen in, in other, in something like say melanoma instead. Um, a good example for molecular is a lot of bone soft tissue is actually molecular based. There's a lot of things that like, if you have this mutation, then it is this entity. Now molecular is the new hot thing. I personally think molecular will one day become what IHC was or is. So when IHCs first came out, it was the hot thing and people were doing fellowships within IHC to specialize in it. And now any pathologist could read, interpret an IHC. So I feel like because molecular is such a new thing that maybe who knows in another 10, 20 years, the general search pathologist will be sending out molecular reports as they correlate with their, um, search path reports. We'll see. That's just my opinion. But molecular is its own thing and it's a one year fellowship to do that. My opinion of it, eh? I don't know. It's very like analytical. You look at a bunch of numbers and letters and you try to make sense of it. Yeah. So that's, that's next gen sequencing for you. Um, in molecular, you also do on a, on occasion, a single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, where you evaluate how well a bone marrow transplant has been accepted because then you're looking at the chimerism, how much of that bone marrow is from the original patient cells versus from the donor cells. And then, the, you know, that's the rate of success of bone marrow transplantation acceptance. Uh, yeah. So that's molecular as a whole. And then the next thing I'll talk about real quick is the coagulation rotation that by itself the coag lab is its own standalone lab in clinical path uh, clinical pathology and for us it's a two-month rotation there's a lot of crossover between coag and blood bank and in practice a lot of blood blood bankers kind of run the coag lab as well but in terms of coagulation it's basically for us it's like i said the techs do most of the testing. We just there to make sure that the test utilization is proper. And we also write uh, lupus anticoagulant reports. Um, and that's really about it. Coag is, it's okay. Writing the reports are meh. It's re interpreting the, the, the results the techs get. And that's basically the job of the pathologist for coagulation. The next one I also have done is HLA and slash immunology. It's also like a short one month rotation for us. HLA immunology department, the main focus of what they do is look at um, HLA cross matching for organ donation. Uh, so it's a bunch of testing that is done. And as a pathologist, you interpret the test done by the text. You'll say like, oh, this, this is the HLA profile of this donor or that recipient. And you'll be like, they are a match or they're not a match or, you know, some variation of that for us. It's a very hands off rotation where, you know, we don't do any of the testing. We kind of like watch the fellow do the HLA cross matching and we get some worksheets about HLA testing and we try to say, oh, you know, like theoretically this and this patient. So it's, it's hands off. It's more of like lectures and doing worksheets. Mm not my thing. <laughs> and then, so the other one I also did was cytogenetics. So for us, cytogenetics was a one month rotation broken into two parts, the cancer cytogenetics and the chromosomal 
genetic component of cytogenetics. So the cancer cytogenetics is where uh, they'll get a sample from say a tumor and they will do the karyotype of that tumor. Cytogenetics is different from molecular in the sense that molecular is looking at the individual DNA details, whereas the cytogenetics looks at chromosomal abnormalities like chromosomal losses or uh, uh, additions or translocations and things like that, they can't get very, you know, they won't be able to tell you what mutations are there. They'll just be telling you there's a loss of chromosome nine or something like that. Based on that karyotyping, that will help differentiate what kind of cancer it is. It's actually very important heme, heme path. There's a lot of correlations between like cancer cytogenetics and heme path because different types of leukemias are basically categorized based on what kind of cytogenetic abnormalities they have and if it's a good prognosis or bad prognosis based on what kind of chromosomal abnormalities. So that's cancer cytogenetics. In terms of, gosh, I can't think of the term, but it's like the genetic portion of cytogenetics is where they kind of do it, say like newborn cytogenetics or fetal cytogenetics like detection for Down syndrome, or if someone, if a baby was born and they have abnormality, abnormal facies, and they have something, signs that show that they have some sort of syndromic issue, they, they will send a sample of fibroblasts to the cytogenetic lab and they will, you know, do the karyotyping and say like, no, this baby is completely normal karyotype, or this baby has abnormal karyotype and they have this syndrome. Uh, so as pathology residents, it's a very hands-off rotation. You kind of basically get some lectures. And the only f interesting part, I guess, for me was I I drew my own blood, give it to them, and I was able to do my own karyotype, which is, you know, normal. Not exciting, but it's kind of cool to look at my own chromosomes. So those are all of the CP rotations I have personally experienced um, and done. And then so the only two uh, CP rotation I haven't personally done is clinical chemistry and clinical microbiology. They're both, I think, three month rotations here for my program. And um, they're both kind of hand off. Every day you'll get, you know, a good set of lectures. In clinical chemistry, you might be um, hands-on in terms of like new tests. You might be doing a QA project where you are onboarding a new uh, clinical chemistry test. In um, microbiology, you might do like all the testing that the techs do to help to like, you know, differentiate your organisms, you know, like, putting bacteria on different kinds of agar and seeing what it, where it grows. And you'll do like the little tray with the different solutions. Like I said, the pathologists, they don't do the testing. That's all done by text. And so what they do is, you know, sign off on like critical values or sign off on like the QI for their equipment. Sorry, I can't give you better details, but it's really more of managing the lab, managing the personnel, managing equipment, uh, making sure that uh, they're operating with a budget, onboarding new tests and things like that. That's all of CP for you. Personally, I found most of it all pretty boring and a good chunk of residents end up doing like a surgical subspecialty or um, an AP fellowship and kind of practice that way, but keep the CP portion because they need it for like job flexibility. So yeah, that's it for um all of cp so i hope you guys found this educational if you like my channel and my content please support me by liking and subscribing and comment down below if you have any questions and i will see you guys next time bye